So <clears throat> these are slightly different from the uh, intestinal flux. The causing organisms for the liver flux include the Conorchus sinensis, the Opistochus viverini, and Fasciola hepatica. Um, and then the cause uh, locations are usually in adults, are found in biliary ducts, uh, and eggs are usually found in feces. Compared to intestinal, we'd say intestinal traumatoids, the adults are found in the intestine. These are found in biliary ducts. And then ingestion of man, uh, in man is foodborne, and eggs are normally operculated. This is general feature for um, uh, liver flux. And you can see here uh, different characteristics, just like how we were looking at the intestinal ones. The Clonochis sinensis are found most in the Far East. The reservoir host is dogs, cats, eat, uh, and other fish eating mammals, including humans. Hosts in the snails are Semisculospira, Paraphoralis, and Melanoides. And then the second host will be the freshwater fish, like um, Cipirinidae. Opithocus viverini and, and Philenius are usually found in Northern Ireland, Laos, and Far East. Dogs, cats, and other fish eating mammals are the, the reservoir hosts. The snail is Bithynia, and the second host is freshwater fish, Cipirinidae. Fasciola hepatica and Fasciola gigantica, they're found worldwide. Their reservoir host is herbivores, and um, the snails are Limnia. Uh, and, and the freshwater plants, like watercress, are usually the intermediate, uh, the second hosts. These are some of the images of these, these uh, uh, liver flux. A is Colnocchi sinensis, B is uh, Opisocus viverini. This one is fasciola hepatica. Remember, I was telling you the difference between fasciolosis boschi and hepatica is this cone that is present in the fasciola hepatica. And then you have the Paragonimus westermani, which is one of my favorite ones. They look pretty beautiful. So these are the, the, the uh, liver flukes that you would. You would uh, uh, Paragonimus, however, is, is, is lung, uh, lung flukes. So we'll not really discuss that much in detail this way. So, I have, a, I have a presenting illness of a question here that um, a 36 year old fisherman from Northeast Thailand present with abdominal distension. He reports that he eats normal diet of somtam and koi pra. These are raw fish that are pickled in lime juice. Pickled in lime juice meaning that these are fish that um, uh, pickled like mango pico and rice so he feels well but he has now noticed yellowing of his skin in the in the whites of his eyes he lives in a small village along the river northeast jungle of thailand he reports that many dogs animals are in the area on examination, he's thin, a febrile male with scleroicterus and large, palpable, non tender mass that is below uh, an enlarged liver. And his skin is jaundiced. All right, so what do you guys think this guy is suffering from? It's a very easy question. You can come in your exam and then you could just justify your, your answers. So think about it, think about this patient uh, and the case we presented as we go along with this presentation. So we'll start with Clonocris and the Opithocris. So these two adults are narrow and, and elongate, and they are located in a more distal, smaller ducts in the biliary tree. Now this, uh, I'm assuming that you know your, your bile duct uh, and the biliary tree, how it's, it's, it's formed in your, in your liver. This will be bile and there'll be bile duct, uh, and then it will be connected to the liver, right? So it's more distal 
uh, and smaller ducts of the biliary tree. Eggs are usually small, ovoid, and operculated, and they're usually fully embryonated when they're laid. They are swallowed, they are swallowed and hatch in the snail to release the myracidium. So these eggs are swallowed and hatched inside the snails to release the myracidium. So this is an example of the eggs uh, uh, of uh, Opistochis and, and uh, Clonochis. The eggs of Opistochis are usually narrower. This is Opistochis and this is Clonochis. They're usually broader. And, and they're all operculated and they have prominent opacular shoulders. Here. And they have this thing called the coma shaped appendage. It's very similar to what you have. Right? Some say fascial hepatic or fascial hepatic. Okay, great. So let's see. So this is this is uh, morphologies of adults of conospi, as you've seen in the picture before. Uh, they're slightly big, about two millimeters in terms of length. And you could see they have uh, testes and branched uterus. Uh, and, and this is the anterior end that has some suckers. This is a uh, more detailed description. This is a oral sucker, and then there's a ventral sucker, there's a uterus that's there. And the lobed testicles and the obliquely placed uh, testes, they're oblique like this. Um, and you have, uh, this is called vitellaria. These are the, the, the transverse in the middle side. And then you have this excre excretory uh, bladder uh, sac like thing for the excretion. So there are some differences in morphology between these two parasites, right? So the differences in morphology between these two parasites are as follows. One is slightly bigger than the other. So Conochis is bigger than, than Opisochis, but the they, are, they resemble in terms of tapering anterior and rounded posterior. So in front, they are sharp, at the back, they are round. And then the testis in tandem position, while the testis are oblique in each other in, in Opisochis. So if you see uh, in Opisochis, they are tandem to each other, but you could see in, in, in um, what is this picture? Testes are usually oblique in each other in opistochis and their tandem position in, in, uh, in, in the clonochis. And then the testes are deeply lobed and then the testes in opistochis are light, slightly lobed. So these are the differences you can look at when you're looking at the images between clonochis and opistochis. Life cycle. Um, again, so this is this is the generic life cycle. You have adults in the biliary tract, while the other parasites you're talking at adults in the in the gastrointestinal tract. Eggs in feces, taken up in the myracidium in the second stage, and then the saccharide, and then metasaccharide in fish, and then ingested. The cycle continues. I've spent so much time discussing this. A similar issue. Um, so adults are found in biliary tracts. Eggs are deposited in bile ducts, and then they are discharged with bile fluids. Another important difference. While the other ones, the eggs are discharged in um, in in uh, in the lumen of the intestine to go to the feces. This one, the eggs are deposited in the bile ducts. So for the hepatic flux, the eggs get in deposited in the bile ducts. The eggs are passed out in feces, and the myracidium develop in the appropriate snail. So it could be semiscolospira or it could be bithia, bithnia, sorry, into sporosis, radia, and eventually into sekari. Now the sekari are liberated and then insist inside water, freshwater fish as meta sekari. Man acquires infection through ingestion of raw fish. So with opistochris and colnorchis sinensis, you would have through raw fish. Hope you're able to follow this. Metasecari then exist inside the duodenum. Remember your anatomy, um, your, this is the esophagus, and then this would be the stomach, and then you would have the duodenum. This early part, you would have here the, um, 
pancreas. And then this is where also the biliary tree is connected. The bile duct would come in here. So they are, they are, they, they, once the eggs are ingested into the duodenum, the metastasicare exists in the duodenum, then they will swim inside the, the biliary tree, biliary system to undergo maturation. It can go up to 25 years. So this is a long-term infection, right? So be aware of that. So as the worms mature, the inflammatory response starts in the biliary epithelium. And then the, because of the inflammatory response, uh, the extent is usually related to how much the, how many uh, metas, uh, uh, metasacari you had and how long have they been there. And the lesions are usually confined to the biliary system. So not really necessarily into the liver itself, but usually confined within the biliary system. And then this way, the results to mechanical irritation and toxins that are, is a result of mechanical irritation and toxins that are produced by the worms. Uh, in light infections, there's little to no change. But in heavy infections now, uh, these, these uh, bile ducts, they dilate so, and they thicken. If you guess what can happen here, if the bile duct is thickening and dilated, you have something called, called hyperplasia of the biliary epithelium. This hyperplasia of, uh, of uh, biliary epithelium tends to be uh, leads to the obstruction of the biliary tract. And then if it obstructs the biliary tract, that means bile is no longer able to come out. So they cause the biliary retention. And then you have cellular infiltration and fibrosis because of the inflammation. You get something known as obstructive jaundice because this bile is obstructed. And then it is aggravated by the formation of biliary stones. Now, if you remember your biochemistry, uh, the gallstones are usually from the because of the of the retention of the um, uh, the bile and the bile salts they come becomes very complicated and eventually you can get secondary bacterial infection leading to liver abscess so the liver becomes and then you have uh, gallbladder enlargement so the gallbladder becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and so forth. So the worm's invasion may, may, may lead to obstruction of the destruction of the liver parenchyma in severe cases. And the hyperplasia of the biliary epithelium is usually linked to cancer of bile duct. So with opisokis and, uh, and clonokis, you can see the direct connection with bile duct cancer. Uh, you have uh, the immunoglobulins, IgA, IgM, and IgG are usually elevated, but um, IgA levels usually return to normal in chronic infection. As you know, IgA is usually uh, not present in, in chronic infections. Other ones would be chronic infections. And the symptoms now, in light infections, no symptoms. We would have an incidental finding. But in heavy infection at early stage, you'll have dull pain and discomfort in the right upper quadrant. You could have diarrhea, you have loss of appetites, and you have a lot of passing of gas, flatulence. As the disease progression and duration and severity, the pain increases. Liver in, becomes enlarged, and the functional impairment is usually observed in, as a long-standing infection. Now, remember, as the disease goes on, this is pain increases. If you think about our patient, the mass that he had was a non-tender mass, right? So you have to remember and connect these things. Liver enlargement and functional impairment usually observed especially in long-standing uh, infections. So these would be the symptoms of these patients. So in large intestine, number of metasacari cause acute infection within a month. You have fever, uh, chills, epigastric pain, large tender liver, and jaundice. And then symptoms can last about one month. So if this is when you engage a large number of metasacari, but if it's a small number of metasacari, it will have to take a long time. So clonocris and opisthocris, usually epidemiology is in human man, dogs, and other fish-eating mammals, endemic in Far East, high incidence in, of biliary tract cancer, human infection from eating undercooked or pickled or smoked saltfish, human feces uh, uh, as food source in fish and ponds can usually perpetuate the infection and snails and fish involved in the, in the life cycle, okay?
diagnosis, history or resistance in areas that are endemic and consumption of raw food, the symptoms are usually suggestive, and examination will give you stool specimen characteristics of these eggs, differentiation of eggs from other species uh, that are found in other uh, uh, in the stool, especially for example, egg getting eggs using duodenal aspirate. So you go with an endoscopy, some form or you have some form of aspiration of the duodenum, you get the biofluid and then you do an examination. You could do direct microscopy or for more ethyl concentration method. Also recovery of adults will be able to do, and as I mentioned, endoscopy. This is an example of an endoscopic procedure. Uh, you will be able to see here just a moment. Let me see if we can play this video. Um, unfortunately, I'll not be able to, let me see. This video is not playing. I'll get you another video that will be playing and then you can be able to see this. Um, endoscopy procedure for that. Treatment is praziquantel uh, and, and uh, 25 milligrams per kilogram. Prevention, cook all freshwater fish. Again, feces should not be used in fish pond without disinfection. Proper disposal of human feces is important. Mass chemotherapy can be useful in this case and health education. All right, so this this is this is we're done with that part, and the next 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 one will start also with the case. This is a fifty three year old woman, and this fifty three year old woman is presenting, uh, who is visiting his family in the United States from Bolivia. Comes with intense stomach pain, and tender upper right part of the belly. She has become a strict vegetarian after being diagnosed with breast cancer and is currently on raw vegetable diet to improve her health. She felt like this was really helping her immune system, but now she's not feeling well. She reports that her breast cancer was a recent diagnosis with localized disease treated without adjuvant therapy. So no lymphectomy or lymph node staging was not done. She does report that she comes from an agricultural area where she, there are sheep. She however reports that she avoids sheep also and has fear of dogs. On examination, she has left lumpectomy scar and axillary scar. Her right upper quadrant is very tender with slight liver enlargement. Laboratories are remarkable for an elevated white blood cell count of 60% in eosinophils and the liver transaminases are normal, okay? So you have to, once you read this case, uh, think about what could be uh, a potential uh, disease for this woman. Then we're going to go to the next uh, now presentation right away. So <clears throat> as a clinical disease, um, this is, Individuals may develop symptoms related to migration of immature worms within a month after becoming infected. Uh, and, and many infected persons are usually asymptomatic, especially in the early phase. While symptomatic patients may report fever, pain in the right upper, upper quadrant, headache and generalized malaise and malaria, eosinophilia is a prominent feature. Prominent radiographic findings and contract CT can have been reported especially these called hypoattenuating tracts. These hypoattenuating tracts are indicative of what uh, these uh, uh, passages of these parasites. In heavy infection, the liver can be enlarged and tender. right side of effusion with eosinophilia can be described. During chronic stage, uh, the dial pain and obstruction of bile ducts can occur, and there's usually no changes in liver function tests. A jaundice is not a usual finding. In this case, now, what are we talking about? Um, Shall I part? I get to repeat this if you have questions. So these are uh, adults are larger in size, and they reside in larger bile ducts and gallbladder. They are larger in size. The eggs are larger in size, and they are percolated and unembryonated when laid. The eggs of a fasciola hepatica are here, you see the population here. 
And you, if you remember the previous image that I showed you, uh, and they can be up to, to 63 by 150 micrometers. The adults can be 20 to 30 by 8 to 8, 8, 13 millimeters. They have the cephalic cone, they are shouldered appearance, which is characteristics, and they have highly dendritic testes. This is what we have. Highly dendritic testes are arranged in a tandem position. Uh, this is the cone, cephalic cone. These are the ventral suckers, uh, cephalic sucker and the ventral suckers. And then you have this um, testis. All right, so reservoir host for partiola hepatica is sheep. And if you ingest the metasacari, for example, for the water from the water creases, the metasacari hatch into the small intestine. Once they hatch, they come out, they go all the way to the, uh, the lava penetrate the small intestines, they enter the liver through the gristle capsule, and then they go all directly to the liver. The adults in the, uh, live in the bile ducts, and including liver tissue, you can see these are the adults here. And then they lay eggs. The eggs are then incubated and hatch in fresh water once you pass the eggs into the small, through, into small intestine and living with feces. And the miracidium uh, penetrates the snails. The saccaria leaves the snail. Saccaria and de uh, develops into metasaccaria and into the watercress, and the life cycle continues. Right? I hope you're able to follow this life cycle. So, as, as that image was showing, uh, this is just more additional text uh, that the adults are found in biliary tracts in fasciola hepatica. And the eggs are deposited in bile ducts and are discharged with biofluids. Eggs are passed in feces. Takes up to two to four weeks to develop in water, the eggs in water. And then they hatch in water. They develop miracidium. The miracidium penetrate the snail, like limnia. The miracidium also develop into snail to sporocyst, radia, and eventually saccharide. Then the saccharide, when it is rebellated from the snail, it insists in freshwater plant as metasaccharide. So this is, I'm repeating myself so that you're able to follow up. Man acquires through ingestion of raw water plants. Metasaccharide exists in the duodenum, enter the biliary system, undergo maturation, and the lifespan in human being can be up to 10 years. Compared to the opithocus and colonocus, which could be up to 25 years. So immature flukes, they migrate to the liver, parenchyma, destroying it as they go. Now, you remember that woman and, and the clinical case I just said, they can have hyperattenuating routes, so hyperattenuating uh, uh, features. So this is what happens. The immature flukes, they can migrate through the liver, wanachana chana liver, and then you can see the, the pathways. So the t and once they heal, the liver tissue becomes fibrotic, and the t blood is consumed, and thus they lead to anemia because they drink the blood. The bile ducts, uh, they lead to hypertrophy, and um, the duct lining, they may become calcified. Abscess can form, and they can even spill, the pus can spill into the liver parenchyma. So especially in established infection, damage from mechanical irritation and metabolic byproducts and also obstruction. This is, this is a pathology. Irritation mechanically, metabolic byproducts of these parasites, and also obstruction. The hyperplasia of the biliary uh, epithelium, the fibrosis and calcification of the bile ducts can lead to bile, biliary obstruction. You have similar changes that can happen in the gallbladder. So reinvasion of the liver parenchyma may cause abscess formation. So they can do that and then they can reinvade the liver parenchyma as they keep moving along and they mature. Other dangers. So in this context, there is with hepatic, uh, uh, with the liver flukes, there's risk for ectopic sites, right? And then they can get out there and then get into the ears, the eyes, the lungs, intestinal walls, the spleen, the skeletal muscles, the portal veins. So there's risk for, for extra, uh, extra liver sites that can be infected because of the migration into the blood vessels. 
So this is this is a, a, an image depicting how this one goes. So this, just to orient you, this is a duodenum. This is a duodenum, and then they 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 are hatched here, and they mature. They penetrate this the skin of the duodenum. They get to the liver parenchyma. They start to move around the liver. Da, 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 get to the bile ducts, and then they lay eggs. The eggs will come out into the duodenum again through the bile biliary system, and then they get laid laid over. Okay. Symptoms during the migratory phase, you've got a fever, epigastric pain, ripe up, upper quadrant pain. That is where the liver is. And then you could also have ulticaria, which is itchy. You have hepatomegaly. You can even have splenomegaly. And especially, uh, this is the migratory phase uh, symptoms. When it is migrating in, in the liver, as this migration I've just shown you here. And then establish infection symptoms associated with biliary obstruction, as I said, acute epigastric pain, fevers, pruritus, jaundice, hepatomegaly, and synophilia. Worms may attach even to the pharyngeal mucosa. They can even cause something known as Halzun syndrome. As I have mentioned that they have a risk for hep extra hepatic sites. Uh, and this is when they go into the pharyngeal uh, mucosa, they can cause a suffocation. Uh, as a Halzun syndrome, which is a temporary um, condition. So Halzun syndrome is associated with fasciola hepatica. Epidemiology, this has cosmopolitan distribution. Cosmopolitan distribution meaning it's a worldwide distribution in both temperate and subtropical areas. Uh, it is prevalent with areas with places that have close association with livestock like uh, um, uh, sheep uh, and humans and snails. There is large number of infection in Bolivia, Ecuador, Egypt, France, Iran, Peru, and Portugal. And uh, the reservoir hosts, as I said, are herbivores because they are eating watercress uh, and plants. This is a major, major veterinary problem, especially in Europe. Infections through this undercooked water plants and also from drinking water that has floating metasacari. Animal manure that is used as a primary fertilizer can also be uh, a, a cause of, um, of the transmission. Okay, great. So how do you do the diagnosis? To do serology, especially in early disease, to check your, your serological tests in the migratory phase. You can do antigen tests. They are very good tests that have very high sensitivity and specificity. Uh, you could do microscopy, uh, but it takes a while. So maybe after four months, you could see to start to see the eggs release into feces, which is much later after the infection. And you could do uh, uh, something known as uh, ERCP, which is endoscopic retrograde cholangiopacreatography. All right, so I'll explain this a little bit for those who don't know. Endoscopy, you insert something for imaging, and then you go backwards to, to check into the bile ducts, and the pancreas and the pancreas to see if you can visualize these liver flukes. And the imaging and uh, the presence of linear migratory tracts, if you do uh, ultrasound or a CT scan, you could see those migratory tracts that uh, show the, the flukes and adult flukes may also be visualized. Um, this is an example, you can see this is a, uh, is a fasciola hepatica. Uh, and then you could see here, this, is an image of the fluke in the bile duct. Okay. This is endoscopy imaging. I hope you're able to appreciate that. And this is a CT scan you will see. So the, these are the, this is the liver, just to orient you if you don't know how to read a CT scan. This is the cross section of a liver. And you could see some of the migratory tracts, these ones, and the parenchyma, these ones, right? We'll go along this, this uh, and then this would form some of the pathology in the liver. So the drug of choice uh, is biotin, uh, also you could use triclabenazole uh, as a single dose. And, and they can usually, Hilda, can you please stop? Uh, yeah, yeah. They can inhibit protein synthesis and have low toxicity. So 
Um, Tricrobendazole is, is usually a drug of choice, but you can use any of these, uh, these two drugs. And uh, prevention, avoid eating raw uh, watercress, and also uh, health education, prevention, pr provision of safe drinking water, strict control of watercress cultivation, uh, killing the snails, although it's not an easy option, but also draining the pasture land. And treating infected animals is also good, especially the sheep. 